Hi, everybody. As always, I am really delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior to the annual Swartz Mind Brain Lecture Series. This year, I'm really thrilled to bring us all together for a special celebration for the 20th year of the Swartz Mind Brain Lecture. And today, we get to host a, a trio of experts in their fields for a roundtable discussion on the broad subject of melding the mind and math, brain science, past and future. For those of you who don't regularly come to this event, although you should, let me remind you what we are celebrating here. So for 20 years, the Swartz Foundation has sponsored the Mind Brain Lecture Series. It's a public lecture series that is intended for a general audience and to bring together the Stony Brook University community with some of the leaders in the field of neuroscience to keep us all up to date with studies of how the brain works in order to produce the full repertoire of our behaviors. The tradition of this gathering was begun in 1997 by Jerry Swartz, the founder of Symbol Technologies and inventor of the barcode reader. And it's brought a distinguished array of systems and computational neuroscientists to come visit with all of us here at Stony Brook. It's been a spectacular 20 years, and this year, to celebrate the Foundation's generosity, we have a special treat. And it's a different forum from the past years. We have three individuals, ex each experts in their field, and each so famous that they actually don't need um, an introduction. Uh, and they're going to respond to the questions that many of you have already submitted uh, via Twitter and the web, and we thank you for those on the subject of how brain science and math have been, are, and, and will be converging to give us new insights into how the brain works. Our super trio includes Eric Kandel, who is winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his brilliant work in the neuroscience of memory, and Jim Simons, an astonishing mathematician, the previous chair of mathematics here at Stony Brook, and a major philanthropist. And third, really the moderator of the discussion, is Alan Alda, who many of you know is a renowned actor, including all 251 episodes of MASH, also in West Wing, most recently in Blacklist, and movies including The Aviator, Everybody Says I Love You, my personal favorite, and most recently, Bridge of Spies. From this list of credits and more, you may ask why Alan to keep these scientists on track. There's a really important reason that Alan has been engaged, actually, in putting together today's event right from the get-go. While Alan has continued his career in performance as an actor, a writer, and a director, I don't know how he does it all, he has also dedicated himself for the last decade or so um, to working with scientists, in particular with neuroscientists, to get us to do a better job at communicating the excitement of scientific discovery to all of you. He's a professor here at Stony Brook, we're all very lucky, leading the Alda Center for Communicating Science. And he's also the recent recipient of the National Academy of Science's 2016 Public Welfare Medal for his contributions to communicating science. A warm welcome, please, for Eric Kandel, <laughs> Alan Alda, Jim Simons. Thank you. Thank you. It's so great to be in the same room and on the same stage with the great Eric Handel and the great Jim Simons. I mean, it's going to be a real pleasure. I notice on the back wall here it says, melding the mind and math, brain science, past and future. I, I wonder, Eric, if, if you would just give us a little overview of what brain science started as, or where it, where it was, let's say, 50 years or so ago, and how we got to where we are now. Uh, well, when I started in brain science, which was 1957, before many of you were born, um, we had a very good understanding of how individual nerve cells work and how they communicate with one another. Uh, we had an idea how 
um, certain behavioral functions occurred in the brain because of lesions that neurologists had detected. Um, and that was really the basis of our understanding. Our approach to complex behavior was very primitive. Um, brain scientists were not comfortable studying behavior, and by and large did very little of it. But soon thereafter, cognitive psychology, people who were studying behavior in rather sophisticated ways, sort of elaborating what Freud had done, but in much more empirical uh, ways, uh, became interested in brain science. And in about 1965, a merger occurred between cognitive psychology and brain science, which really gave rise to a new science of mind. And that received a tremendous impetus, a tremendous spurt from molecular biology, which was coming along. Because before that, most biologists were not interested in the brain. Why is that? Because the anatomy was boring, and understanding current flow was beyond most biologists. You had to know Ohm's law and stuff like that. People like Jim Science knew that stuff, but most of the other people didn't know that. <laughs> uh, but once molecular biology came along, and you realized that certain molecules were not only found in the brain, but also found in the liver. You saw the universality of biological processes, and that brought them into the game. And that has had a tremendous impact. And with that also, with time came imaging, so that in experimental animals, and even more important in people, you could begin to see what happens when we have a conversation, when you think about something, when you do something. So it's brought brain science a long way. I mean, we're very far from understanding the brain. I would say we're maybe 20% you know, there in an optimistic moment. Uh, but we have a very good start, and we're moving at a reasonable clip. You've reached the point, I take it, now just from my general reading, I get the impression that you've gone from an examination of individual cells to considering cells as they interact by the hundreds or thousands. Is that the point where, when, you, when brain science started to explore that? Is that the point where you needed, you must have computational analysis, you must have a more sophisticated kind of math? Yes. Uh, you actually need math even for understanding how single cells work. Why would that be? Uh, well, in 1952, two British scientists by the name of Hodgkin and Huxley uh, developed what is called the ionic hypothesis. They explain how the action potential is generated and how the resting potential is generated. Okay, so, now I have to stop you right there so I can understand what you say after this. Okay, so. They, um, they studied how the action potential uh, is generated. Uh, uh, Somebody's uh, nodding her head. Thank God, uh, somebody uh, else needs it besides I'm you. I'm sorry, For, forgive me. <laughs> okay, now mo many, many people here know exactly what Eric said, but some people are at my stage and we want to, we're curious, we want to know. So the action potential is what, a current down a, a neuron, it's an electrical a, current? It's an electrical signal that is propagated down the neuron. So let me begin. A nerve cell has really several elements to it. It has what are called dendrites, which are processes that come off the main element called the cell body that has a nucleus has dendrites, and that's where other cells connect to it. The cell body then gives rise to a long structure called the axon that ends in terminals that contact the neighboring cell. Uh, so and that's the where way the information synapses? propagates from the cell body to the terminals right. is by means of a signal called the action potential. Right. And that's an electrical signal that's self-propagating. And the mechanism of that propagation was worked out by two major scientists called Hodgkin and Huxley. And Huxley was a mathematician, and the last of their four papers is essentially a mathematical exploration explaining the nature of the action potential. That was really the first e important mathematical contribution to neuroscience, and it was of extraordinary importance. So even though it was only one cell they were talking about, as I understand it, is this correct? The, the way the current get, goes down the axon is because of a whole lot of things happening in the membrane. The, uh, uh, atoms 
going out through gates and other atoms coming in through gates I, and that makes it go down. Okay, so at rest, the axon has what is called a resting potential. It's minus 60 millivolts. Uh, and that's due to the flow of potassium ions. And it used to be thought that what happens with the action potential is that the resting potential is erased. And one thing that Hodgkin actually were able to show by directly recording the action potential is it not only wipes out the resting potential, but it overshoots. And that's because another class of ions, sodium ions, move from outside to in. And they worked all that out, and then Hodgkin uh, sort of stepped to the side, and Huxley worked out mathematical equations that explained the resting potential due to potassium, sodium coming in, generating the action potential, and repolarization. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too difficult to follow. Uh, there are electrical signals in the nervous system, and we know how they work. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking my language. Okay. So, so, Jim. Take our word for it. <laughs> In the nervous system, that's the least of our problems. It, I should it, say one other thing. Oh, sure. Um, what also was, was uh, worked out at that time, and it was really a controversy, is nerve cells communicate with other nerve cells through a juncture called synapses. And that works through the release of a chemical substance called chemical transmitters. That also was worked out. And various chemical transmitters in the nervous system, like acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, they were beginning to be characterized in that period. Now we have an excellent understanding of how nerve cells function, how they communicate with one another. There are always little subtleties that are answered, but by and large, we understand that. We want to understand more complex functions. And that's, of course, where mathematical treatments come in. Well, Jim, what? What kind of assistance can a, a mathematician give to, to uh, an experiment in brain science? It, 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 is it that there are so many things going on that you need, you need to be able to track well, them mathematically? Well, there aren't a lot of things going on. The brain has roughly uh, somewhere around 100 billion neurons. That's about the same number of stars as there are in our galaxy. And that's a lot of things to keep track of. You know, 100 billion is not a small number. And, uh, and they're connected uh, by synapses, and there's a lot more of those because many nerves are connected to a lot of other nerves, and so the synapses are, are hundreds of billions. I, I don't know, maybe a trillion. A trillion? Is, could, could that be a trillion? Anyway. so. There's a lot of stuff uh, to keep track of and going on at the same time. Not every neuron is firing every second, of course, but uh, there's traffic that's, that's, that's going on all throughout the brain uh, while, while we're awake and to some extent even while we're asleep. So if you want to analyze traffic, you, you know, it's, it's kind of a mathematical problem, problem right from, right from the get-go. Now, there are certain uh, helps that mathematics can, be, can bring to bear, which is, uh, I would say, infrastructure assistance. So, for example, uh, I mentioned this to you the other day when we were chatting, uh, we can record neuronal activity uh, by putting probes into, let's say, a, a mouse's brain, electrical probes. Which will, which will signal when a, when a neuron is, is firing. And a typical probe might have 10 sensors as it goes down this little teeny spine that goes into the, the brain. And it, I don't even think it hurts the mouse, actually. So anyway, that's, uh, I watched a brain operation, and the doctor was putting his finger on the brain of the patient, saying, where do you feel this in your body? She didn't feel it didn't in her brain. Well. Apparently, the brain. Doesn't well, she'd been drinking that, at the time, hadn't she? No, she, she, no. no she would say, I, oh, if I feel that in my big toe. He said, okay, you, you'll need that. We won't cut that part out. But so she, I was just confirming that the mouse probably doesn't feel it. Yeah, I think, he, I, I think the mouse doesn't feel it. But in any event, whether he feels it or he doesn't feel it, or she, whatever the sex of the mouse might be, uh, <laughs> uh, 
So put on, put down. You want to understand neurons firing in, in, uh, in a multiplicity of places. So you put down maybe 20 of these things, spines, and each one will has 10 detectors. So that's, let's say, 200 things that you're going to be measuring. So you start recording all this activity, and well, the signals from here and signals from there, but they're very difficult to tease apart. Two neurons might be right next to each other. Am I listening, recording this one, or am I recording that one? It, it, is this the same neuron firing twice in a row, or is it one a little bit nearer? That, that creates a, a, a statistical and mathematical problem. Is there a good algorithm for separating? It's called uh, spike sorting. And a spike being a signal. A, so yeah, every, action spike potential. on the chart. Action potential. Every action potential gives a spike yeah. uh, as the electrical signal signal is generated. So there's it, it's a very difficult problem to sort these spikes. And uh, mathematicians have come along and come up with uh, better and better algorithms for doing spike sorting. I think we're supporting some people in our foundation who I think now have the very best algorithm for spike sorting. And uh, I suppose better ones will come along. So that's a way that mathematics is not going to learn, it's not going to teach you biology, but it's not even going to model biology. But it's going to allow biologists and neuroscientists to see what's going on much better than they could have seen without mathematics. Do they have a trouble communicating with each other? Does the mathematician readily understand what the brain scientist understands and vice versa? Does the brain scientist understand how best to use the mathematical modeling, for instance? Well, in this case, the, the brain scientist wants to see the spikes sorted, and then he or she is going to do their, their own work. The typical people who do this, uh, the guys in our group, know a fair amount of neuroscience, so, so they, they can have an intelligent conversation with the experimentalists with whom they're working to develop this uh, this algorithm, but it, it's uh, this is this is uh, as I said infrastructure stuff. On the other hand, if you want to do dynamic modeling of uh, uh, neurons in a, in, a, in a different way, uh, mathematical models are going to have to be developed to uh, try to explain and interpret uh, how how information is being processed in the brain. For example, Eric learned uh, a lot about memory. I think that's perhaps what you won your, your prize for. Uh, so memories are encoded, some in a part of the brain, which is the hippocampus, I believe. But how is it encoded? What, 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 what is the, uh, what's going on there? How, how, how are different memories encoded, and how do we retrieve them? Very fast. We re we retrieve a memory very fast. And uh, so it has to be compressed somehow and encoded. And what that mechanism is and what the mathematics is of the, of the compression is, uh, is not understood. But it is going to take some mathematics, I think, to uh, dope that out. Do you agree with that? I completely agree with it. In the last several weeks, we've made enormous progress. Let me. Uh, talk to that. But before I, I begin on memory, let me make a general appointment which continues the theme that Jim is developing. Uh, with the exception of Hodgkin Huxley, who collaborated very effectively, you know, both of them were biologists, but one was also a mathematician and developed this powerful model. Uh, model building in the 1950s and 1960s uh, was not very useful to brain scientists because the models were built out of speculation, not because there really was a lot of biological data uh, available. And the models didn't attempt to make predictions that would allow the model to be falsified. That is a new era that emerged really in the last 15, 20 years, in which very much, as Jim told you, biologists and mathematicians work together, understand each other's mission and influence one another. And the purpose of the model is to explain how things work and make predictions about future events or future kinds of things you should look for. And in searching for that, you can either strengthen the model or you can falsify it. 
Let me say about progress in memory storage. Uh, we've learned within the last year, but first of all, a major class of memories, what you think of memory, a memory for people, places, and objects is stored in a region of the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, if you remember this patient, H.M., who uh, didn't remember from one day to another what was happening to him, it's because he had lesions in the hippocampus on both sides. Uh, we now know, and we can label in the brain, that when you learn something, for example, you learn a particular position in space, um, a group of cells in the hippocampus becomes active. And we can label those cells. And then we can ask the question, if those cells are active when you learn something, what happens when you recall that memory later on? Is it the same population of cells that are active? And we have labels we can put on those cells, and we can see it's exactly the same population that is active when you recall it. You can now do something very interesting. You can label those cells with something called channel rhodopsin, which is a, an ion channel, a marker, <coughs> that allows you to activate those cells by simply shining light onto that region. So you can activate the cells involved in memory storage and produce a false memory. When you say a false memory, you mean something that never happened, or it just makes you remember something that no, happened? No, something that never happens. So I learned something in this particular space, yeah. okay? And those cells are active. Now, if I move to that next space, those cells are not active. But if I artificially activate those cells, that animal thinks it had been in the space before and it remembers it. So you can create false memories. So we're now beginning to understand manipulations, which are both beneficial for our understanding, but also could be potentially dangerous if misused, that are really quite profound of how memory works and how we can move it around. And all of these things become quite sophisticated. And we'll remember, will require more model building. And so the interaction between you know, computational neuroscientists and brain scientists is absolutely standard. You know, your department here, every good department, has in its uh, faculty a significant group of people that does computational neuroscience. In the, in the, um, in the Renaissance, a, a common dinner, dinner table uh, game was to see how many things someone could remember, and they would use what they called memory mansions. They Rooms. Would, they would have a an imaginary house, or maybe a real house. This isn't my... And they'd put the, if they had to remember 100 objects, they'd put them in different parts of the house. And then as they walked through the house, they'd remember 100 things, which they wouldn't be able to do without an aid like that. Are, were they using memory cells? I mean, the place cells that, that just uh, we're just hearing so much about? Uh, they may be using place cells to help them do this by spacing it in different locations, activating yeah. different place cells when you were thinking about the fact that my grandmother is in this room and my mother-in-law is in that room, their names. Right. Yes. What? So one of the, 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 the points that Alan is making, uh, one of the interesting discoveries that emerged, which we don't fully understand yet, is that um, the cells of the hippocampus encode space. May I get Please up? Stand up? Yes. Uh, if you can. <laughs> so if you were to look at my hippocampus right now, you'd see that there are a group of cells that fire when I'm here, brrr, like that. Another group that fire when, the, when I'm here, brrr, like that. Another group that fires when I'm here, brrr, like that. And every time I come back to the same place, those same cells would fire. So this is really quite amazing. And you can see, if you can now control those cells artificially, how you could fool the animal into thinking that it's one space or another. But it also raises a more profound question, which theoretical people and empirical people are um, examining. If, in fact, this is a major structure for memory storage, how come representation of space is so important to it? Why do you think? Anybody have an idea? That's one reason, but another thing. He said you could be able to move around with this uh, space, spatial understanding. There is an argument 
that almost everything that you remember consciously is in a context. So we're going to remember this discussion among the three of us in the context of this auditorium. And you're going to remember it if you remember anything about it, and we don't urge this on you. Does <laughs> <laughs> anybody remember anything so far? <laughs> so, I mean, that's an interesting problem. Again, this is a problem that theoreticians and experimentalists... So now let me ask you a question based on what you just said. When I was talking to Jim McGaw, the memory researcher... Outstanding. He, he made a big point out of the fact that you your chances of remembering something are greatly enhanced if there's an emotional context to the event that you're going to remember. Any emotion. It doesn't have to be fear. It could be joy, exultation, disgust. So the question is, what does that have to do with place? Um, emotion is mediated by a structure called the amygdala. Uh -huh. Amygdala mediates both positive and negative emotion and has extensive connections with the hippocampus. So, that's, so it, that's, that gives us and a, you an can emotional actually, connection. This is another thing that people have been able to do just recently by manipulating cells. So you can, an animal can learn something which is very painful and activates the part of the amygdala which mediates unpleasant emotion. And then you can trick the animal by activating part of the amygdala, which is pleasant, uh -huh. and have it respond with pleasure to something that previously scared the hell out of it. So in principle, this one might, might be useful someday for treating post-traumatic stress disorder, uh -huh. helping you overcome the painful thing. So it sounds like maybe you get help from both the place and, and, the, emotion. and the emotion. Yes, well, many things converge with powerful memories. Which is maybe why we all remember exactly where we were when we had that strong emotion when Kennedy was shot or yeah. other uh, giant yes. events. Yeah. I, yes. I associate that event, for instance, with getting out of the car and seeing the fall leaves on the ground yeah. because 15 seconds later, my neighbor told me yeah. about the assassination. And probably often when you do see fall leaves on the ground, you're brought back to that, uh, to that memory. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of entry points. It. There's a lot of entry points yeah, into yeah. memory, any little collection of which can trigger, can trigger that memory. And pr probably the more profound and important the memory is, the more entry points there are to it. So uh, you can recall it quickly. I'm wondering about... I've, but I want to say something about oh, these, sure. these place cells. Because I heard of an experiment. You know David Tank at, yes. at Princeton. So he told me, he's a well-known neuroscientist, and so Eric told you about place cells and how they fire when you're in different places in the room or in your environment. And they, uh, this was very recently discovered, a Nobel Prize was, was given for this a year ago or two years ago. Um, so what this fellow David Tank did, he said, okay, I'm going to, uh, so what's a, what's a place? Let's say it's a two-dimensional array, of, and it tells you where you are on the X, Y axis in the room, more or less. So he came up with a different two-dimensional domain altogether, and it had to do with sound, frequency. One dimension was the frequency. Was it a low frequency or a high frequency. That's a one parameter family of things. And the other was, I think, the intensity of the sound. Was it loud or was it soft? So, okay, it was a, a loud C sharp or was it soft uh, B flat or whatever it was. So that's a two dimensional array. Then he gave rats, I think, or mice, uh, a way to uh, put pressure on a, like a joystick or something, and travel through this array. If you pushed it here and there, you'd get a loud A, or, or whatever it was. Different positions of this, or different forces on this stick would produce sounds in, in the two, this two-dimensional array. And it turned out that the same place cells were firing. The same place cells that told you where you were on a floor 
were telling you where you were in this two-dimensional array. That was quite astounding, it seemed to me. I, I think I got it pretty right. Uh, so the place uh, cells are used for more things than finding your way in a maze. In this particular example, or, or yes. Out, or, yes, so maybe they, well, whatever it is, uh, those same place cells were, were helping to guide the mouse or tell the mouse yeah. where he was in a different kind of two-dimensional array. So it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. you, were, you said something the other day that was so interesting. It was related to all, all, all the things, the changes, the physical changes taking place in our brains. You talked about infants and how fast they're making, how many synapses oh. they're creating. Well, it seemed like a fantastically yeah, large here's number. A, here's a statistic that I learned a few days ago. A baby in the womb brain is developing very rapidly. It's highly developed. It's not completely developed. It's highly developed when born already. Now, I, I told you how many uh, neurons there are and how many synapses. So at a certain point in the baby's development, synapses, new synapses are being created at the rate of 40,000 per second. Per second? 40,000 per second. And that is a true statistic told me by a woman who's an honest woman. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's this thing where they have to be pruned, huh? Well, as Eric knows does more the about the pruning, pruning go on? than I do. How, how when, does pruning stop at a certain point? Uh, there are two points. Before we get to pruning, Yes. Uh, Jim made a very profound point. Um, I recently read up on um, competitive sports in young people. <coughs> because it's really quite scary when you realize what happens in the National Football League to kids, to adults who play football. They have brain concussions repeatedly, and after a while they get severe brain injury. And you realize that with kids, this is also a possibility that actually this occurs. And until quite recently, kids were encouraged to suck it up and go back and play some more, even if they bunt their head very seriously. So that can cause really quite significant brain trauma, which you want to avoid. But similar, if not more severe brain trauma, can come from social deprivation. So in this period, when you're forming all these synapses, if you don't get affection from your parents, if your parents pay no attention to you, if worse, if they abuse you, you have serious consequences for your brain. In fact, the hippocampus, this area that's involved in brain damage, is significantly smaller if you come from a very financially impoverished home. Now, one doesn't know whether this is lack of food or just the social pressure that a family is under, but four independent studies have shown that if a child is brought up in a highly impoverished home, its hippocampus is going to be substantially smaller. Pruning, you produce a lot of synapses because you want to make sure all cells appropriately interconnect with one another. But at about puberty, you begin to have a peeling back, a pruning of these synaptic connections. And we were talking about this. A very interesting discovery emerged just a week or two ago. Um, it has been known that in schizophrenia, uh, and I think this is also thought to be true for autism, there is an excessive pruning of synaptic connections. And one of the reasons schizophrenic people have difficulty, particularly with their prefrontal cortex with certain cognitive tasks, is thought to be attributable to this excessive pruning. One also knew that there are certain genes <coughs> that uh, mutations in them are specifically correlated with schizophrenia. And it turns out people have analyzed two of these very recently and see, to see what their function is. And it turns out these genes are involved in pruning. So the first time in schizophrenia that we've identified a gene with a specific function, which is really significant progress, and it's interesting that it turns out to be involved in pruning. So now what happens if uh, instead of, um, what, if you, what if you don't get enough pruning? Is there, is there a disability associated with that? It could be autism. Autism, some people think uh, there's not enough pruning that goes on uh. at a certain stage. And then, and then 
there's overload instead of underload, and, and that could cause uh, that could You cause form problems. inappropriate connections. Yes, yeah. that's right. So, uh, and, and it's, it's difficult. I wonder if in the so-called idiot savant situation, you have, you have an excess of cells that can perform certain functions, but others that don't. It's possible. Possible? Certainly possible. Which, which, which is my half-baked theory, and it, it reminds me that I wanted to ask you both. I've, I've heard of mathematicians working with brain scientists as uh, theorists. They're called often theorists. What, why does a mathematician offer theory? In what way does a mathematician offer theory that the brain scientist doesn't? Um, they think in more conceptual terms than brain scientists do. And they have, you know, a mathematical approach to explaining that. Uh, so they bring a different set of skills uh, that biologists, by and large, don't have. Now, some biologists do have that, but most biologists don't have that. He's in a better way to explain that than I can. Well, <laughs> well, models of things are typically uh, mathematical models. Uh, my business for a while after I left pure mathematics was trying to model financial markets. Uh, and uh, you develop ways of looking at the movement of stocks or commodities or one thing or another. And you see mathematical patterns of one sort or another. And you say, OK, well, this is we can model the stock market uh, with these patterns. Uh, and it sheds some light on what's going on. Not, not as much as I'd like to shed in what's going on, but, uh, but, uh, but it helps. It, it, it reduces the uncertainty of certain things. So models are typically mathematical models. And, uh, you know, uh, Michael Faraday uh, did most of the basic work in understanding the interactions between electricity and magnetism. But he didn't no much math. And it took the next guy, um, Maxwell. Maxwell, thank you. <laughs> now you can see what's happening to my head. <laughs> it took the next guy, Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, to interpret what Faraday was doing with a real mathematical model, namely an equation, so so-called Maxwell's equations. So you can think of Faraday was the experimentalist fooling around with, gee, look, look what happens here when I turn up the magnetic intensity. I get more current flowing. Gee, they seems to be things are going around in circles. What, whatever it was that he was developed, what he was showing. So he was the experimentalist, but he wasn't the model builder. Far, uh, uh, Maxwell was the guy who really uh, built, built the models. And, and similarly, Probably. Now, Faraday, uh, 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 Maxwell might have been wrong. Uh, you know, he wrote down these equations, and then they really had to be tested out in the laboratory, so to speak, and say, is, is, is he really right? And the same thing will go on in biology, where experimentalists will have some data. He'll show uh, a mathematically inclined person, oh, I think I, can, I think I can make a model of this. And they'll write down some equations or whatever it is. and. Uh, something in graph theory or whatever branch of mathematics is going to be convenient. And then we'll say, well, here's my model. The experimental will say, good, let's try it out. Let's see if it actually predicts what happens. If it does, great. Sometimes it does, and you've made progress. Sometimes it doesn't, and well, it's back to the drawing board. And, and that's the interaction that will, that will take place, I think, for years in biology. As, as we begin to understand these processes better and can model them. They'll be Tim, mathematical type models. Could you go into just a little bit for my benefit to, so I can understand a little better than I do now what a mathematical model is? You have the brain, you have some understanding of it, you want more understanding. What the model sounds to me like you're matching up elements of the brain that you're aware of you're tracking them with some kind of um, system of getting signals from them, and you're attaching, uh, you're making them data points, and you're doing mathematical 
manipulations that give us more information? Well, I don't quite get how the model works. Well, I'll give you a simple example of a model that could apply to neuronal activity. So um, you could, uh, you know what a matrix is? It's an array of uh, Outside of being a movie, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> Who knows what a matrix is? Oh, okay, we've well, got enough matrix. You got enough. You can talk to There's them. enough matrix knowledge out there. So. <laughs> well, a matrix is a big array of numbers. Sometimes it's squared. It has the same number of rows as it has, as it has columns. And, uh, in, and the matrix I'm about to describe is a square matrix. So I say, okay, I have all these neurons. Uh, well, uh, gosh, 80 billion. Okay. And some pairs are connected, and, and the connection has a, has a direction. So I say, okay, I have 100 billion columns and 100 billion rows, and I want to fill in now a number at each place in this matrix. Well, there'll be a number only if neuron I is connected to neuron J. There'll be a number. Moreover, I can say, oh, I fires and hits J, so it's a positive number, it's going in this direction, and there's a particular strength in the synapse, so I'll just write down a number that corresponds to the strength of neuron I going to neuron J. Now you'll get this gigantic array of numbers. Most of them will be zero, because most neurons are not connected Every, a neuron is not connected to every one of the neurons in, in, in the brain, uh, a, a relatively small set. So it will be mostly zeros, but it's a great big matrix. Okay, so that's a model of the connectivity of the brain. Now, what is that, what's going to be the dynamics of that? Well, you could then fire up a certain uh, threshold in each place, uh, each guy, if he's he, he's going to fire, he's going to make uh, the, next, uh, the next guy's fire. Uh, the numbers can be negative because a neuron can be a, a uh, inhibitory neuron. So it could, it could fire in this direction and that'll dampen down. So you can see these are the pieces of a model. It's way too simple-minded to do much of a job. But on the other hand, there it is. It's a, star it's a starting place for trying to analyze this big network of neurons. And it it's sounds a like you're saying model. once you have the model, it sounds like you're saying you could say if this happens between these two points on the model, then if we do this between these two points on the model, this should happen and this would be involved in this activity. So you can predict parts of the brain that might be involved that you, you can, wouldn't have you known. You can actually, tell, I mean, he gave a wonderful example. So let's assume we have two structures two nuclei that are interconnected, but we don't know which particular cells in one connects to which particular cells. Let's say we have a driver population and a follower population. Um, so what you can do is you know that the driver has to precede the follower because it triggers the action potential. So this action potential has to occur before that. And you can also have some precise idea, if you look at a lot of them, if you see that this one consistently fires before that one, what is the separation between them? So you can infer, if you have that kind of separation, these cells are directly connected. So you'll see that some cells are directly connected, others are not. And you can ask the position, what is the position in space of the cells that are connected to each other? Is it the extreme of one nucleus connecting to the center of another, or is it matched in some other way? And you can test these things first theoretically, and then you can actually trace those connections anatomically and see whether that model is correct. So am I right in thinking that the model gives you a place to look anatomically? Exactly, which you can now... Predicts where you'll find it. Exactly. Okay, I'm a little... Okay, yeah. that's, so that, that, that's a okay that, that pays my way here today. That's no, good. no, 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 no. These I, are no, sophisticated. No, I learned something, then I, then I feel okay. No, no. But, I mean, what, what has really made it so powerful is that the models, number one, allow you to pull together complex bodies of data that are difficult to deal with intuitively, okay? And two, it allows you to make predictions that you can then test biologically 
to either falsify or verify the model. Very so powerful. It, it sounds as though the, the more deeply you study the brain, the more you must rely on this kind of Absolutely. computational analysis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because knowing see, where things are in the when brain. When we were looking at know. one cell versus another cell, yeah. we didn't need it. Yeah. But now when you're looking at how 100 cells interact with a couple of hundred cells, you, it's very difficult to make sense out of it intuitively. You need mathematical models. They become more and more important. What, what do you both think, given what we seem to know now, what do we need to know next? What, what's sort of on the horizon? What's possible to know? It, it, not necessarily blue sky stuff, but maybe it'd be interesting to know what you think it's possible to know eventually. But what, what's soon to be known? What do, you, what do you need to know? So for example, um, we know a lot about the early stages of visual processing because of work by people like Kufle, Hubel, and Weasel. You, I mean, you don't know these people, but they showed that at different points in the visual system, cells respond to different stimuli. And the most interesting thing they found is in the cortex, you begin to move from responding to circular stimuli to responding to linear ones. So some cells respond to linear stimuli. They go up and down. Others that have specific acts of orientation, OK? Period, end of paragraph. Further on in the visual system, we have an amazing thing. You have cells that respond to faces. There are six patches in the brain called face patches in which cells respond to faces. But the question is, how do you construct those faces out of these linear, the cells that respond to linear stimuli? So the whole in-between area needs to be worked out. Here's the sensory system we understand best, and there are major holes in our understanding of it. In most cases, we don't have a very good understanding of the cortical representation of different sense modalities and how they work. So that's a major problem. Um, with memories, I pointed out before, we're just beginning to see that memories in the hippocampus involve populations of cells and how they work and how they can be recruited. That's a very important advance. But this is just a recent kind of thing. We know nothing about the major mental illnesses or psychiatric illnesses, schizophrenia, depression, manic depressive disorders. We're beginning to make, as a result of Simon's foundation, a lot of progress on autism, but still got a long way to go. So in terms of major psychiatric illnesses, even neurological illnesses, we're very, very far. I, one time when we were in conversation, you said that uh, especially coming from psychoanalysis, as you have, that cognitive psychology gives neuroscience questions to be answered. Beautiful. I'll give you an example. Psychoanalysis, um, Freud was the first person to sort of, people talked about it before, but first person to emphasize that part of the mind is conscious and the large part is unconscious. And he actually spoke about different kinds of unconscious processes. First, he spoke primarily about instinctual processes, aggression and eroticism. But then he had pre-conscious, unconscious. He had the superego, the fact that we uh, unconsciously make decisions because we think they're morally right. Um, but we know very little about the details of them. Cognitive psychologists are beginning to study this. For example, there's evidence from cognitive psychological studies that you can make decisions in two ways, unconsciously and consciously. Uh, if you have to dis choose between many options, five different apartments, then making the decision unconsciously is better. Mm. If you have to choose between two, you know, one partner or another, better to make a conscious decision. <laughs> That's really quite fascinating. What's the, what's the uh, evidence for that? How does that play out? Why, what's the People reason People have for shown, it? because, well, the logic of unconscious processes allows itself uh -huh. for multivariate kinds of analysis like that. Uh, but this is interesting stuff that's just beginning to emerge from cognitive psychology. We can now begin to explore in biological terms. Reminds me of um, 
what I think of as a largely unconscious state that I think neuroscience calls the default mode. When you don't think you're th yes, certain really areas doing, of the brain get active under those. You feel like you're just Marcus Rakel, yes, just sitting there, or sometimes taking a shower or driving. You're not really thinking. Of, I had a friend of Robert Ludlum who wrote best-selling novels by deliberately putting himself into that state. He'd go driving for two hours with a yellow pad next to him, and suddenly ideas would occur to him. But he wasn't I hope thinking. He stopped. I, I hope he stopped. Say, him. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter, he's no longer with us, so I don't. No doubt. I'm not so, sure why. But I, I want to say something. Sure. To add to this: what's in the future? Because a great deal of neuroscience, rightly so, has been devoted to analyzing the brain's response to external stimuli, whether it's how our eye works or how our ear works, what happens when someone kicks you in the shin or taps your knee, or all this stuff that's coming in from outside, physical stuff. Because we can control it so easily. Yes, and we can do those experiments and, and, and understand. But an awful lot of what's going on in our brain is internally. Internal. You sit there and you think. Right now, some of you are actually paying attention to what's being said up here. <laughs> now, it's coming in through your ear, but that's only uh, incidental. It's information that's coming into your brain, and it's going to cause, maybe you'll remember it, maybe you won't, maybe it'll trigger a whole train of thought. Well, what's all that about? You can sit in a chair and have a very, very active brain. You could be thinking about a math problem, or you could be thinking about a romance, or you could be thinking about uh, uh, God knows what. All of that, the dynamics of the brain, the, the, the stream of consciousness, uh, uh, the train of, train of thought, is not really understood, as far as I can tell. And that's a, a whole other area which is just now beginning to be approached. That sounds so much like yeah. what your background is in psychoanalysis. The associative bringing to the surface, the associative process of oh, bringing I, to the surface I, I, what's I, happening I, under. I, I agree, and you know, the tragedy is that psychoanalysis never became empirical. Yeah. Uh, Freud was an extremely good biologist. Uh, and made several important discoveries in biology. He was the first one that showed the nerve cells of simple animals as exactly like nerve cells in your brain and mine. So he showed the conservation of evolutionary processes applied to the brain as well. And he only left biology because in those days, in order to make a living in basic science, you had to have a private income, and he wanted to get married. Uh, so it does all relate to sex. It all relates to sex. <laughs> And he, in 1895, wrote a theoretical paper, incomprehensible, uh, in which he tried to develop a neurobiological model of repression of unconscious processes. And he realized this is ridiculous. Our understanding of the brain is so primitive, you can't possibly explain psychoanalytic ideas. But someday, he said, biologists are going to be sufficiently sophisticated about the brain that they will prove many of these ideas that I have wrong. But <laughs> The psychoanalytic community was so successful for so many years. Many of you are too young, but when I was a house officer in psychiatry, you couldn't be chairman of the Department of Psychiatry unless you were a psychoanalyst. It was dominant mode. Only with time they realized that many of these ideas were not tested empirically. So are, are now as you um, evoke memory, as you suppress memory, are you, are you getting close to to reproducing Freud's uh, repressive, repressed well, we, memories? We, 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 we don't know. I mean, we need to explore. We're now in a position to test some of these ideas yeah. uh, and to begin to explore unconscious mental processes and see how they work. I mean, he was the first one to point out that most of your life is unconscious, and this is true. You and I, the three of us, are having a conversation. Yet when I talk... I don't think ahead of myself, you know, this is the sentence is grammatically correct. I just spit it out. Now, granted, it's not grammatically correct and it's probably incoherent, but I do spit it out. <laughs> so but it's, isn't that amazing it's, it's how amazing how much know. of it is preconscious. It's, yeah. it's just astonishing how so it is. So, what's known about that? Relatively little. 
but this is something we can get at, certainly with imaging. And I'll give you an example. Stanislav Dahan has recently done a very beautiful set of experiments. Uh, he's, and this is, the experiment per se is well known, the result is not known. Uh, if I show the two of you an image, very briefly, with a masking stimulus, uh, you will not be able to recognize it. A masking stimulus, what do you mean? A, another stimulus that interferes with your perception of this. Ah, okay. Like the way I, the magician... I, I, I show you the face and then I hold this up, okay? Uh -huh. Or if I just show it very briefly, let me not make it complicated. Yeah. Yep. If I'm imaging your brain at the same time, it shows that the occipital pole, that is the back of your brain, which first processes visual information in the cortex, lights up. So even though you're unaware of it, the cerebral cortex already gets involved. The highest processing region already get recruited, even though you're unconscious. And I'll show you the same image for a longer period of time, so you can really perceive it. You're now consciously aware of it. You see that that information, instead of being just localized to the back of the brain, propagates forward and interacts with many areas and comes back again. And this is something people have predicted, that consciousness involves the propagation of information so it can be used by a number of different areas by the cerebral cortex, speech area, action area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a beginning of getting a handle on some aspects of consciousness, which would be really fabulous to sort of understand in greater detail. Well, I think we've covered brain research from the past to the future. Where's, where's Many Lorna? years in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lorna, do, do we, do we want to, where are you? Do we want a question from, let's take, let's just try one question from the folks out there. Do you have a favorite here? Yeah, you like, well, here. Oh, this is a hard one. <laughs> Him. <Yeah. laughs> I was, I, 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 this made me think though, when I, when I read it, I thought, well, what, what, what does the question even mean? And what's the answer? What's the relationship between the brain and the self? Is the self just a persistent illusion according to modern day research? Or is it, what is, what's the difference? Or what's the connection? The self is a perception that you have of yourself in the brain. Every mental process, from the most trivial, you know, hitting a backhand in tennis, not so trivial for me, uh, to thinking creative ideas in mathematics, all comes from the brain. And the self is a perception you have of yourself as a unity that's built into the brain. And yet there are times when you don't know who you are. I mean, or there's, there, are, there are times for some people. Only after a lot of wine or something like that. <laughs> Most of the time, I know all too well who I am. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, I, I want to chime in on that, because that's a, you know, it's really a, a profound question, it seems to me. You know, we talk about my hand, my foot, my brain. Who is this my? Who, who is, who, what is this thing? And, uh, and it's obviously something that has emerged from the structure of, of our brain, uh, this concept of self. I don't know if a dog, certainly a bacteria does, know, ha, does not have a sense of self. I mean, I can't imagine a bacteria. A dog has a, has a sense of self. It might, okay, maybe that high up. In contradiction to, to another animal, for example, or? Yeah, yeah it, it, uh, it My bone, my, that's my that's bone. That's my bone, okay, yeah. that's my bone. Uh, <laughs> No, so no. somewhere in, the, in, this, in this evolutionary uh, process, the notion of self has, has arisen. And uh, it's a very profound notion. And uh, I think the, the physiology will clarify this at some point. We'll understand what, what networks are really what we call But, but it's a very deep question in terms of it, figuring this out. It's a profound question. It's part of self-consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe we've, we've reached the, the, the end of the hour. It's, it, it, has anything occurred to either of you during this time that you said, I really want to squeeze this in? Not immediately. <laughs> 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 is, 
there anything you're glad I didn't ask you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here, and thank you to my two friends. Thanks so much.